thank you for coming to the second day of the Pixel Point uh, Festival and the second day of the Void, as we call it, the second part of the program. Um, tonight, uh, or today, uh, me and uh, Jan will present. I'm, I have to say I'm a philosopher interested in media archaeology, accelerationism, psychoanalysis and let's say French theory. This will be kind of uh, become explicit more during my talk. And uh, Jan Kostanievets is a philosopher, a software developer and a PhD candidate among many other things. And um, I'm happy to say that we are here in the void, uh, which was created by Tommaso Campagna and Jordi Guerrero in um, collaboration with the Institute of Network Cultures. So uh, I will give the word to them and then I can start. Hello. Hi everyone and uh, welcome one more time. Just as Max and uh, Janice mentioned, this is The Void, this uh, pop-up uh, green screen studio. So a little bit about us. Uh, the Void is a research project on tactical video and an um, audiovisual publishing venue for practice-based research. What does that mean? There's a lot of research uh, out there done not necessarily through text form, but through other forms of media, such as video, uh, music to performance. And The Void started more or less as a way to get that out into the world, so to publish it. Think this as a book, as an expanded form of publishing, but we made it into a video but also not only a video, but a hybrid event. So an event that it's at the same time in this physical space and online streaming, and you, the audience on the physical space, actually have the privilege to experience both at the same time. So we're trying a bit to collapse this dis distinction between uh, um, virtual and physical, and actually realize that every virtual space is also at the same time a very physical space, and vice versa, every physical space is a hybrid space. Uh, so, a little bit of etiquette around the void. What we want to do here is to make explicit the infrastructure needed for streaming. Whenever there is an event, normally if something goes wrong, there's a technician in the back and then everyone waits awkwardly for the technician to do something about it. Here, we want to put up front all of the material processes that you need to get at uh, to, to set up a streaming. So, you see all of this cable mess, all of these computers, all of these different devices. And if anything goes wrong, then we'll just fix it. It's going to be part of the show. And for that, I'm asking you to embrace the glitch, embrace the, uh, the difficulties, and embrace the awkwardness. Not always happens, but it might be the case. And uh, finally, also to mention that The Void is not only me and Tommaso. It's a larger collective that uh, spans a lot of different people. Uh, uh, Ray Doliste, uh, they are... Uh, um, a recurrent collaborator, Julia Timis, uh, Clara, uh, that I see over there, has also been a recurrent co collaborator. Dominic also collaborated with us yesterday, uh, and a bunch of other people uh, uh, working and not working around the Institute of Network Cultures. And that being said, I'm going to give back the microphone to Max. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I have to relax because this is an interesting thing I want to explore with you. And um, like this uh, talk that I will present today is, let's say, a second part of the project I'm currently working on. It's called like psychotic accelerationism. Maybe it's funny or, or not, but uh, it's a continuation of the series and it develops some topics in more depth and uh, in this iteration uh, the Luz and Guattari are kind of the main protagonists whereas in the fir first text the proposition was done purely through the Lacanian perspective. So yeah, what is the meaning of intensity? This will be kind of the main thing that I want to explore with you today and during the talk you will see that um, 
this also happens within the work of the Luz and Guattari, that like desire is slowly kind of substituted for intensity as it moves from uh, Antidepus, the first book of capitalism and schizophrenia, to the second book of uh, A Thousand Plateaus. And um, yeah, like uh, I will focus more on the Luz during this talk, but uh, we have to keep in mind that this is a joint collaboration and the critique of structuralism was basically started by Guattari. Even, I mean, he, he was kind of instrumental at least within uh, b b uh, <laughs> how he kind of arrived at this machinic part that is so kind of relevant within anti Oedipus as kind of uh, a full-blown full long critique of uh, structuralism. So yeah, let, let's start. Like the revolution that happened in 20th century philosophy in continental philosophy is highly connected to this kind of um, um, uh, differential perspective on uh, understanding relations. First, it started within linguistics, like Saussure and others and then it kind of had a big splash within philosophy especially within the French context and various theories kind of were uh, heavily uh, inspired by this linguistic term and that's why like as I write uh, structuralism is an attempt to understand relations through a differential perspective like through binary oppositions contrasts, and so on so like uh, the their functional role becomes determined by this, uh, uh, how they are kind of uh, differentiated within the system that uh, s structures them. And um, th like structuralism became a very useful tool in multiple domains like uh, for example, Claude Lévi-Strauss in uh, uh, anthropology, how he kind of um, systematized this um, kinship relations through this kind of structuring chains. And, uh, but Deleuze and uh, Deleuze and Guattari go a step further because for them, like structuralism, even if it kind of desubstantializes uh, the meaning behind uh, different kind of uh, terms or, or, or like um, uh, t terms, yeah, or, or even concepts, like because in a differential uh, setting, like the meaning of something in, is always provided by this opposition, like there is no ne necessary relations between the signifier and the signified. So th this is like important per step that structuralism makes, but, but it still kind of operates at this uh, level where structures are already put in place. It, it doesn't give like a, a proper kind of uh, genealogy of how structures form uh, the, uh, in the first place and how this can be kind of grasped at its core or at its genesis. And this is why like for Deleuze from difference and repetitions and logic of says on, onwards and then with Deleuze and Guitari project together, like uh, he is more most influences with the process by which things become what they become. And uh, so that's why like for them, like going beyond structuralism means like grasping this kind of um, uh, micro or, or kind of uh, as they put it like molecular level or, or when they call it in relation to the desire like in this kind of germinal flow how then this kind of pure potentiality of uh, let's say desiring production is transformed into this kind of uh, let's say in the context of the family relations in this kind of uh, s s s structural uh, differentiated landscape and um, yeah because like I, I was reading anti Oedipus so that's why I can provide an example from there like uh, there I, I don't remember the name of the chapter but the logic of how structuralism operates is well explicated by them even if it's then critiqued in the second instance but the classic example is that like uh, 
of structuralism is that like the relations are are set in oppositions to one another, and this is how like th this is how they they uh, form uh, like th this is how they are composed uh, later like. I know, like, um, like um, there are all these structural oppositions that determine their role and w how they can be combined further. So, for example, like in the case of the family, like because uh, like inheritance is done through the male line, then like the the role the role of the father is kind of. Um, has this kind of outside uh, perspective on of on the family because like uh, the like the continuation of the family is done through the male line whereas the the line of women in the family doesn't have this outside uh, perspective but but is more internal and that's why like women are uh, kind of um, like uh, they are kind of determined by their role in exchange. So like the role of daughters within the family is to migrate from one family to the other and therefore change uh, like, um, uh, like uh, change position within this uh, family networks. Whereas kind of uh, the, the male line, at, at least how it was traditionally formed or in this um, societies that uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, analyzed, uh, uh, like the, the, the male role is somewhat different to that. And these oppositions can be further explained even within the family, not just how like uh, one family uh, exchanges uh, with the other, but even within the family. So for example, I'm kind of fascinated by the role of the uncle because the uncle is interesting because um, in one sense it doesn't have any role in the future of the family. Like his or her nephew or her niece, like uh, their parents are the ones that are kind of um, the ones that are, that are taking care of uh, the future of the child and making all the necessary moves. But precisely because of, of this uh, structural exclusion of the uncle he can be for example the source of truth for the uh, nephew because of this exclusion and therefore it has this kind of position of the outside like like uh, it's again like a, 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 um, it has this kind of a paternal role but that is excluded from the family imposition so this is how structuralism operates. It tries to understand this uh, structuring chains and what kind of function they have within these uh, op opposing principles. And um, yeah, so like th th this is how you do an analysis and understand what the role of each uh, participants is in different structure. Um, but yeah, like. Uh, and this then we go further in Antidopus and uh, Deleuze and Deleuze and Guitari then explain the how this process of structuring happens through the coding of desire and how these roles, these roles that form this network of relations are cons constituted in the first place. So. In, in their reading, like the prohibition of incest is kind of uh, the main way to understand this process because what exactly is the prohibition of incest? It's simply that some relations are prohibited in favor of another. So like uh, how these chains are composed is uh, like is determined by, by this prohibition so that the roles between let's say members of the family are therefore defined in this way and the structuring principle can therefore apply or it can be kind of uh, yeah it, 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 it apply it works because if there would be no prohibition of incest 
the roles within the family couldn't form and it, they will be constantly reconstituted in, in a process of flux. So this kind of coding of desire couldn't take place. So this kind of prohibitions are explicitly connected to the coding of desire and that this kind of oppositions can form this network of relationship that I was already talking about. Um, and this is why, for example, in this concept uh, context, I like the uh, one definition of ideology that simply states that ideology is simply what goes with what. So this is like how I would like have one liner of structuralism, just kind of what goes with what. This is kind of the, the easiest way to understand it in a sense. And this is also why for uh, Deleuze and Guattari, incest doesn't exist because the relationship themselves do not pre-exist their coding, which emerges through the ways in which desiring production is entrapped within a specific network of relations. And the Oedipus, Oedipal structure is precisely like this, um, like this first entrapment of desire, because like immediately desiring production is turned from its um, its direction that moves outside of itself and is channeled internally within the triangle of the father and mother and child. So this is how desire gets encapsulated within a relationship, within this structural relationship that wasn't uh, before that present, like before the uh, oedipization of the psyche you have this uh, famous uh, concept of partial objects where desire uh, doesn't have any kind of overarching principle of or any kind of like top-down imposition of what kind of uh, r relationships uh, are possible and what. So yeah, that's why like they critique lack and so on. But this is like... Uh, yeah, and, and like th th this is why like uh, the Luz and Guitari are, are kind of famously antagonistic to uh, psychoanalysis in that book and precisely antagonistic to the ahistoric uh, conception that uh, psychoanalysis has to the Oedipal structure. And um, not only that, their critique is broader because um, uh, like because if we don't take into the consideration how desire is structured and how this process manifests, then we simply reify the structures that are currently in play and don't necessarily uh, understand fully what is behind this genesis and what kind of processes are actually in play. So, for example, like potentially arbitrary differentiations are kind of understood as the kind of the the uh, like the, the the kind of the key um, oppositions that have to be uh, understood and uh, kind of accepted in any kind of uh, relationship or are kind of uh, universal within different concepts uh, contexts and so on um, and I believe that, um, that that's why like I write how things are expressed that not ne does not necessarily reveal their true nature, but rather offers a glimpse into a specific local context or network of relations within which these relations form a distinct configuration. And this, this can be like actualized even within like uh, today's social context, like because these structural oppositions provide only an insight into a specific setting and how like relationships form within it and there is no kind of there's no necessary objective nature to these kind of relations they, they are just kind of like uh, they just kind of exist within a partial setting that isn't like that, that isn't necessarily fundamental in, in any sense and we can simply infer anything kind of objective from this fact. So this is why, this why like whenever we have like fragmentation within our society, th th there 
are always disputes of this nature. Like uh, people just say like um, your concepts are trash or or you you are talking about something that doesn't exist or like uh, you have this kind of uh, disputes about different kind of um, knowledge systems that can be mapped onto one another and therefore there cannot be any consensus between them uh, what are the key relations and what are not. Um, and that's why like the immanent principle within for the loose is so important because um, it it enables one to kind of uh, I mean it has m multiple uh, important uh, values for the loose one is that uh, relations are not overcoded so for example like um, like if we think that something is fundamental we project this belief into each context and therefore kind of make this categorical mistake that we are talking about the same thing even if this thing is realized differently within a specific context and therefore has a different kind of role or should be interpreted in a different way. And the immanent principle is basically to fight this overcoding, to kind of talk about things uh, through their direct, um, in, in the most immanent sense, in the way that like talking without presupposing anything in advance, but strictly kind of following how these uh, concepts have been uh, uh, forming within a specific setting and simply kind of trying to understand them within this particular configuration. Uh, but but yeah, th this is kind of, uh, let's say, uh, 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 from where uh, anti-Oedipus, uh, how far anti-Oedipus book goes. But But then like, there's still more to be said about this problem, and this is why I now turn to another Deleuzian book, uh, the famous uh, difference and repetition that kind of also kind of um, jump-started this new philosophy of difference for Deleuze and kind of was again uh, a really important uh, book and uh, project for him. And so, like, to understand how this differential relations are formed, the loose turns to differential calculus. And he has, of course, his own kind of interpretation and his own reading of uh, the calculus. And um, here you have kind of two uh, pictures on the screen and uh, through, it, through them I will hopefully make clear what uh, he has in mind and how kind of we can understand this kind of his perspective on the problem when it comes to um, understanding how relationships are formed and how they co-determine one another. So in differential calculus, uh, the instantaneous rate of change, like we, we try to kind of grasp the instantaneous rate of change of one value with respect to another, like the most kind of uh, standard example, like if you watch this tutorial videos is for example, like um, distance with respect to time, for example. And uh, this is done through the left picture, like, uh, like you, you have a graph and a function. And so you're trying to minimize the interval between two points like x and x2 on a function and by bringing these points as close together as possible uh, we approximate the tangent to the curve at a specific point with increasing accuracy so like th this is this process approach as zero so at some point basically like you you arrive at a limit and the tangent at that specific point point perfectly kind of um, approximate the slope of uh, the gradient of the function at this place. Um, and so like by, by doing that, uh, the pro this process yields the first derivative, which represents the slope of the function at that point and thus the instantaneous rate of change at, at the, the slope. So like how one value changes in relation to another is now kind of uh, perfectly co-determined. And therefore, like if you want, like, and that's how we, we, 
we get uh, a relationship between two values that up, uh, that are kind of perfectly approximate the rate of change between one another at a at a particular uh, uh, position on a function and the first uh, derivative then gives you a perspective on the on the slope of the uh, of the f of the function and then like if you want to understand more about this function and therefore about this relationship we want to understand the second derivative and this the second derivative um, goes further showing whether the slope's rate of change is increasing or decreasing like if this is a, a negative uh, curve like a negative con cave or uh, positive or concave like if the, is the, if the slope has a positive or a negative value and then the, the third derivative goes a step further and measures the rate at which the curvature itself changes and so on and kind of capturing higher order changes in the function's behavior um, so yeah like th this is <laughs> how Deleuze reads this and um, hopefully I can uh, tell you the best way I can. So like Deleuze makes crucial modification to the standard interpretation of the differential relations because for him the function is not predetermined but is constituted through the co-determination of uh, dy dx to these two differentials. So like uh, the, the key thing is that for him, um, when, when we kind of establish this relationship, it's not simply that we kind of uh, get a point on the, on the function slope and therefore can approximate the first derivative, but the function itself gets generated with this relationship. So the dy dx establishes the whole of the function in relation to that point. So this is the key difference. And the farther one approximates the function from this singular point, the more insights, insight one gains into the dy dx relationship. So like, we, like the connection between two, two values, for example, or, or like two terms, like um, uh, is progressing. Uh, th through this further and further approximation of the relationship. And yeah, now, now this is kind of the key. <laughs> uh, the extent to which one can extend the function depends on the singular starting point. So, like, as I already said, like, dy dx establishes the whole function at this specific point. And this determination, this determines the function specific behavior around that point, including its, its tendency towards divergence or convergence. So like depending on how, on, on where on the function this relationship was established, uh, is connected to how this relationship uh, progresses from the starting point of, of the function. So like, uh, that's why singular points are where the function undergoes, sh and that's why like, um, like th th that's why like, uh, th this is now uh, another key point that um, because the relationship of dy dx establishes the whole function this function like is constituted through this kind of further and further approximation of the relationship so like farther and farther we can extend this function farther and farther this relationship applies but as soon as this function cannot be extended further this relationship is transformed into another function with another singular starting point and therefore the dy dx relationship again is transformed and transforms in its nature so that's why like in in the image that i provide on the slides there are this for example local minima and maxima that kind of uh, 
provide a local instantiation of this dy dx relationship and how this dy dx relationship manifests within a local setting. But each of these singular points kind of transforms the nature of the function itself and, and how this, uh, this relationship is realized or expressed. And this is why the, the bottom picture show is kind of like another key concept called Taylor series, like how far from the starting pro point a function can be approximated uh, until like it, I mean, there are multiple interpretations, but like uh, until in our case, it becomes another function with another singular point. So basically like what I want to say here, it's simply that like, through differential calculus, like the loose kind of tries to understand how relations change during this, uh, through this process of uh, like uh, uh, approximation and uh, differentiation because like, like because in, in that sense, like each singular function can be understood as kind of a active uh, logic of potential, kind of introducing shifts that create pathways to emergent structures, aligning with the loose conception of difference as a generative force. Like this is just kind of a reiter reiteration of, a, or of what I already told you. And, um, and like, because ju just to kind of say it again, so it's more clear, like, um, the dy dx relationship is kind of uh, a representative for the whole function, but how this relationship comes into play can only be expressed locally at a specific segment on a function. And therefore, like when you move from one locale to the other, this relationship kind of is expressed in a different way. Like, and, and the properties of the function at that place are different and therefore behave differently. And um, that's why like the nature of the relationship between two values cannot be fully informed from a specific local configuration. As such, configurations only reveal a limited segment of their full potential. Like the, the like th that's why like we, we can't like go this, like th that's why like it's impossible to kind of um, to simply infer the objective properties of relations simply from another setting because this is just a particular instantiation of this fact. And that's why like the problem arises this, that intensities are not expressed in their entirety, but rather through local codings and interpretations that overdetermine them and situate them within narrow contexts context that lack the means to articulate intensities in their fullest expression. Because like we are just kind of tracking one sp particular segment of, of this uh, uh, dy dx relationship without taking into considera consideration how these relations manifest at some other like singular points along this uh, function that, that has, has different properties to it. And as long as we kind of stay within one point and try to understand the relationship from simply just one perspective, we are lacking this full appreciation of the relationship and the kind of universal character of it. And this is where I kind of try to connect this to the um, psychotic accelerationism that I was, I was already talking about. and how, like, and why, for example, um, like, why, <laughs> why it's, why, why there's this tradition of this kind of alternative way to understand and appreciate how knowledge gets um, generated and so on, but I, I don't want to kind of uh, uh, diverge too much. I just wanted to say that like through the psychotic lens, we can understand more concretely, like what Deleuze was trying to do with differential calculus that I wasn't necessarily 100% able to express. But le let's see if this will 
do it. Like psychotic subject, I always put it in square scare quotes because I don't think that psychotic is necessarily a subject but operates at another level but still like there are again two levels of interpretations that fall uh, seamlessly within the actual virtual distinction that is operative for Deleuze and Guattari and there are therefore two levels of interpreting what a psychotic subject is like one is a clinical subject in the uh, Lacanian sense and the one is this kind of um, uh, uh, the Lusian, uh, 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 like uh, desiring production approach to, to how to understand the problem. But like if, if I start at the beginning, um, what characterizes the psychotic subject is the foreclosure of the name of the father, i.e. a failure to enter fully into the symbolic order. Because a psychotic does not internalize the symbolic, they have a fundamentally different relationship to language and to intensity. And if we model the psychotic on the extensive level, on the particular locale of the function, what I was kind of describing beforehand, on the local characteristics of this kind of uh, uh, network of relations, we arrive at the clinical subject. And, and this is why, because the the, because the, the psychotic subject uh, uh, doesn't internalize the symbolic order and therefore doesn't have this kind of uh, in internalization of the relations that are operative within this specific locale, but freely moves across the function and across this local uh, maxima and minima that kind of uh, try to form relations outside of this uh, network of relations that are kind of prevalent within uh, the symbolic order of, I don't know, like uh, a, a specific kind of structure, be it the family, culture, and so forth. So that's why, like, from the Lacanian perspective, um, because like the the, uh, the 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 critique operates at the at the uh, uh, molar or actual level, we always talk about the clinical subject because within a specific local instantiation, the psychotic can only be met because it simply isn't like they simply don't track reality because they are making connections that uh, don't make any sense within this kind of particular setting. And that's why, like, like if these connections don't manifest themselves, like, if there isn't any chance of kind of this uh, connection between desiring machines, then a psychotic subject simply becomes a body without organs and their uh, kind of uh, desire is kind of um, uh, rejected and passivized. Whereas, um, whereas... On, on, on the other hand, there, there is no this uh, difficulty, but I, I just want to, because I see that, the in, but, but even within psychoanalysis, we have this really important concept of the enigma of the signifier that is kind of really important for the psychotic subject in, in their uh, an, uh, understanding of the psychosis, precisely because the, the enigma of the signifier exists precisely because there is no internalization of the name of the father and therefore there is no locale within this uh, function and therefore kind of the only thing that is being kind of recorded by the psychotic subjects are intensities themselves outside of any kind of particular relationship. That's why kind of enigma is, is so big. Um, and yeah, and yeah, that, that's and, and, and that's why like, like this is really important because without the other, the psychotic subject also lacks the stabilizing effect that structures the neurotic sub subjectivity, and thus allowing for free movement between these singular points on the function. And in the absence of the other, intensities can be expressed freely, or at least they don't need to be overdetermined, or there is there 
the, the only w way psychotic can kind of uh, track intensities is through an iman immanent way because there is no overcoding that happens through them um, and and for, for example and these are like many examples like there are many many impositions of this structure but like for example the easiest example to kind of provide for you is how like for example the mystic kind of retreats to the desert to experience the full scope of intensities outside of established relations and conventional coding codings because you want to exit reality as further as possible so that this kind of pure intensive relations can start to get hold again because as soon as we are kind of grounded within a specific locale like we are stuck within a, a, a specific kind of structuring principle and therefore cannot kind of experience the intensities on their own grounds or outside of this vector that's why like for example i know like uh, like even like in relation like uh, th that's why the the outsider position is is so kind of uh, satisfying in some sense because like there is no grounding like this exclusion can be very productive be pre precisely because there is no kind of other uh, when it comes to this position and within the psychotic mode there is a unique opportunity to express intensities in a more imminent manner as i said revealing things as they are in themselves independent of particular empirical configurations like specific space-time settings that, that's kind of uh, the, the key point that I will try to kind of um, tell you through some examples and um, yeah I mean like the psychotic epistemology diverges like fully from the, the the classic one precisely because kind of it accumulates knowledge in in a fully different way like um, simply <laughs> through these uh, intensive connections without overcoding and like we could do a great like historical analysis of different traditions within history of different approaches that are w w that were or still are working within this psychotic vector but i just want to kind of uh, tell you like a, a couple of examples so that uh, this will be like uh, more clear and um also like uh there's another paradox with this that precisely because there is no grounding for the psychotic subject there is no locale no necessary connections between things that are there for another type of knowledge the psychotic sting that their mode of kind of accumulating knowledge is more objective precisely because the knowledge acquisition doesn't have a subject and therefore relations are formed without any kind of this subjective imposition of or subjective overcoding and that's why like uh, psychotic theorists or scientists or whatever <laughs> i know how funny this sounds but um they they use this kind of different methods that apply these principles so for example like like how in uh, gemat gematria or, or uh, kabbalah like one gets symmetries based on different kind of uh, sentences or words based on based on their numerical value and therefore outside of any kind of semantic uh, connections or like the the relationships between different words or sentences are established outside of any like uh, meaning they are purely quantitative but precisely because they are established through this way they are more rigorous and objective from one perspective or for example with jung and the concept of synchronicities another thing happens like um because like uh when it comes to dreams like Jung was really, really fascinated with dreams like uh, dreams don't have any causal structure like relationship 
within dreams are simply like a movie, like movie doesn't have no causal structure. It's just like putting things together even if they don't necessarily work or they don't operate on the normal physical level. Like even video games are, are more causally uh, encapsulated than dreams. But precisely because of these things, there's a possibility of making connections that are kind of operating outside of space-time or outside of causal relations. And therefore, they have the possibility to kind of reveal the patterns that would uh, alternatively remain hidden. So this, this is always like, it, it's always this kind of perspective. And for example, this kind of all causal thinking to making connections is always pr also prevalent in some other things like in AI scenarios like Rocco's Basilisk where the AI from the future has a causal influence on the now even if it doesn't exist for example yet. So even if like the connection isn't there currently, it's still taken uh, as a fact. And um, yeah, and, and I, I could tell some more examples, but uh, I, I'm not sure if that's necessary. And yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's, that's kind of it. <laughs>